Hey everyone, welcome back to the Amusing Matters in That Podcast. I'm your host, Brian. And joining me today is a special guest, Haley from Michigan. It's Ryan Fela. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, Brian. How you doing? He's part of the rock group, Cascade Riot. And uh, first off, congratulations to Michigan for being national champions. I guess, do you watch college football at all? You know what? I don't actually. I'm not I'm not a fan, but believe me, I am surrounded by enough people that are. So you, you hear about it constantly. Very big around here. I was going to say, was everybody out burning their furniture and everything? Yeah. <laughs> I actually saw that on Instagram a couple of times, too. I think, like, man, there must be an old piece of crap got you out there. Or if you're burning some good furniture, I'm thinking, like, what the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Actually, you guys are hailing from Detroit? Yeah, we're, we're right in the Detroit area. That's pretty good. And uh, actually, how far is Ann Harbor, just out of curiosity? Ann Arbor is about uh, 45 minutes to an hour from about around where we live. Not not very far. I see. And how's the weather been? Because actually, it really cooled off the last couple of days. Are you guys oh, getting hit yeah. pretty hard? The weather is horrible right now. We had what was basically a blizzard yesterday, and it's continued today. I'm looking out my window right now. Just snow, wind. You know, I, I don't want to go anywhere today. So here I am talking to you, and I'm happy to be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, a child and he wants to go out and do that old sled ride he used to do back in the day. Or is there not too much hills in your area? You know what? It's not. I, I will say the snow is not a. It's not that much, but it's just nasty. It's just lots of wind, and I don't want to be out there. We're judging for Siberia once we're going out to the grocery store or something like that. <laughs> so, all right, that's all good. So, Ryan, I want to welcome you to the podcast right here. And uh, the way this is going to work is let's get to know more about Cascade Riot and also you in general. I guess if you want to fill in about your music, too, because I guess before we hopped on, you had also mentioned about releasing a new EP, which we'll get to in just a moment here. So so I guess uh, the first question right here, let's start with you in general. So who is Ryan Fela? How did he become a musician? Um, you know what? I started playing music when I was about seven years old. I was I my eighth birthday, I think, when I got my first guitar. And... Um, you know, I I still see myself as that same kid, you know, deep down. And really, I got started just by raiding my dad's record collection. He was into a lot of classic rock bands from the 60s, you know, so your Beatles, your Stones, the Who. So that's that's kind of the stuff that I was listening to, just whatever he had. I got into that. I also have an uncle who, who plays music, so there were always guitars around. And so I was exposed to that very early on and just became enamored with it and decided one day I wanted to play music, um, hooked up with the guys and actually Adam, who plays bass in Cascade Riot. I met him in middle school and uh, we've we've been playing basically on and off together ever since. So I've, I've known Adam since sixth grade. I see. And I guess I'll go ahead and talk about the band a little bit, too. First off, how'd you come up with the name Cascade Riot? Cascade Riot. Uh, I, I wish that there was a big backstory there. Honestly, we just we needed a name and we we thought it sounded cool. So we, we put those two words together and that's, you know, that's just what we happen to land on. So I don't want to, you know, it's funny because a lot of people will read into it. Say, what's, what does it mean? What, what does Cascade Riot mean? And it's like. It's just a name. It's just a name that we thought sounded cool. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, normally there's meant to be some sort of symbolism or metaphor behind there's, the name. I, there's times. no symbolism. I will come clean. There is no symbolism behind it. Um, you know, we played together. Like I said, I met Adam in sixth grade and we played with friends in middle school. We ultimately hooked up with his brother, Alex, who is our drummer now. So Adam and Alex are brothers in the band. And um, we've been playing together, like I said, on and off ever since we were kids. So the roots of Cascade Riot go back really far. Now, what we consider Cascade Riot proper, that started in 2015. That's the first time we named the band Cascade Riot and played music along the lines of what we're still playing now. Uh, that's so sweet. And uh, actually, it was a you always have like those little brother sort of like duos who always come in to, like certain bands too. When you think about the Abbott brothers with Pantera and the Van Halen guy brothers. Addy and Alex. Yeah. Addy and Alex. Yeah. Well, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what happened was, you know, I, there you go. 
Yep. I was uh, I was friends with Adam and I'd be over, you know, at, at his parents' house at the time because because we, we were kids and Alex was the younger brother. They would be hanging around and, you know, I was on guitar. Adam was on bass. We needed a drummer one day and we, we turned to Alex and just said, hey, you know, get over here. You got to learn drums and come play with us. And it worked out. You know, he's he's an amazing drummer. He picked up on it just like that. But but yeah, it all came together very, very naturally. I would say it's almost meant to be like those comedy moments where he's probably playing on drums. He just all of a sudden both turn you're like, yeah, there well, he is. Right oh, there. This, this, this guy's getting it. I mean, right from the right out, you know, right from the start, it was like, yeah, we all are. We, we don't really want to play with with other people, which is interesting because of, uh, you know, we ultimately that was when we were in high school and we wound up. We wound up going our separate ways because, you know, we were we were kids trying to figure it out. And those two did end up playing with some other people in another band for for a few years. But, you know, we found our way back to each other because we couldn't we couldn't stay apart for too long. Yeah, somehow music pulls you back together. Yes, I guess uh, I guess uh, elaborate a little bit more on the band, too. So you started taking it more seriously in 2015, too. So did you go through numerous lineup changes with like adding some other guys into it, maybe another guitar player or keys or anything? No. So like I mentioned, we played together kind of in high school, mostly just for fun, go our separate ways. They play in another band for a while. Um, 2015, is like I said, we got back together, named the band Cascade Riot. And um, it was the, it was just the three of us, you know, me on vocals, guitar, Adam on bass, Alex on drums. And we just we kind of did what we'd always done, except by then we were a little more seasoned. I'd like to think, you know, we were better at what we were doing and we got out. We just put ourselves out there. We were playing shows. We released an EP in 2015 called Code Red. That was the first time we ever really released anything and put it out there. The three of us for people to consume. And um, no, so we just we just kept carrying on kind of the way we always did. And we, we, we took that kind of as far as it could go. Um, that lasted for about a year or so. And then we wound up going on another hiatus because, you know, life kind of took over. We still hadn't quite figured it out yet. And, um, all, you know, we wound up getting back together again a few years later. And we're still together now because I think we finally have landed on the formula, how to make this work, how to keep the band together. And, and it's, uh, we're in a, we're in a really good spot now. That's very good to hear. Yeah. And, uh, I was going to say, are you guys still a trio or did you guys try to include? No, like, no. Else? So it's, so actually November of last year. So not that long ago, we added, uh, Nick Masson as a second guitar player to the band. And it's something that we had thought about over the years. And we were always hesitant to do it because, A, I think we romanticized the fact that we had played together as kids this as this trio, you know, and we that was kind of our identity. So it's like we are the trio. We've always been the trio. We will always be the trio, you know. And then um, but we would talk about it. And we were just really afraid of affecting the chemistry because. You know, anybody that has played in a band will tell you the chemistry is just as important as anything. And all, you know, we, I think what it was, was playing the shows that we played this last year. Um, we just realized, you know, we, we wanted to add someone else in there to help fill out the sound a little bit. And we, because we released an EP called Page Not Found in May of last year. And uh, getting out there and playing those songs you know, you have to, when there's, there's multiple guitar parts in that song, nothing, nothing crazy, but you know, we color the songs with multiple guitar parts. And when you're one guitar player and when you're singing at the same time, you, you can only do so much. And I think playing some shows last year, we realized, yeah, let's, let's bring somebody else into the fold. It's only going to make things better. You know, if it's the right person and give us a, a fuller sound, we don't have to admit, omit guitar parts like we're doing now. So yeah, we brought in our buddy Nick in November, and he's he's settled right in, man. We're about to play our first show with him actually uh, February second, so we'll see how that goes. But I, no, I'm sure it'll go well. We've been practicing a lot and just really, really clicking. So just super excited. 
Yeah, that sounds exciting too. And is it just going to be at a local pub down in Detroit there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a place called Smalls. Um, we're actually calling it our EP release show. Like I said, February 2nd, it's technically in the city called Hamtramck, but it's it's right outside of Detroit. It might as well be Detroit, to be honest. Yeah, you tend to run to a lot of pubs that are still in around the big city and everything yeah. else, too. I guess, uh, how's the music scene in Detroit? Is it starting to really grow, or has it always been kind of consistent over the years? You know what? Um it's it's hard to say. I you know playing. It's it seems like there's not as many bands around now as there were when we were playing, you know, some years back. But there's definitely there definitely is an underground scene. There's a lot of great bands. You see a lot of house shows. Um, it's a lot of you know it's a lot of DIY. Um, I think the problem is it doesn't seem, you know, I I, w- I remember there being more venues in the past. And I think, you know, that's something that I think is kind of, you know, everywhere. COVID, I think, had a lot to do with that. It affected the way bands are able to get gigs. A lot of venues didn't survive and had to shut down. So I think you just you have a lot of people just figuring out what to do. And um, a lot of the house shows, I think, are kind of almost out of necessity sometimes because you have bands that want to play and and they need somewhere to play um so you get that i think you know personally what we do i'd like to see i'd like to see more like, guitar driven rock bands um because there are you know there's definitely a healthy music scene but i want more guitar driven rock just because that's that's my preference that's what i like to listen to and uh but you know but they are out there you know that's not to undermine anything else that's going on I'll say it said more cowbell you need more guitar that we sort of need, thing we need more cowbell and more guitar <laughs> i guess have you guys tried to use a cowbell in any of your songs no i actually when i <laughs> i was just thinking that in my head i'm like we we got to slip some cowbell in there it's like more so during the beginning parts too when they're just starting to do don't fear the reaper <laughs> yeah that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's all cool but i guess uh We'll get to COVID just a sec too, but how would you describe your genre again? And also, uh, what does your lyrics tend to delve into? Because it seems like lyrical wise, you guys seem to delve into like maybe a little motivation. Because a couple of songs I heard, the one was the Chasing the Stars one, which I guess you recently released. And the other one was I Don't Want to Fall Asleep. And then I Didn't Come All This Way for Nothing too. So yeah. if you want to elaborate on lyrics, go ahead. Lyrics, you know, I think you just you you report on w- what you're going through. Um, you report on just the human condition in general a little bit. It's a lot of it's a lot of thoughts put in a blender. You know, it's not always linear. You might you might have a feeling, and you kind of write lyrics based on that feeling. Um, I can tell you, like our most recent song, "Chasing Stars," that was just you know that was written a few what was that last year? I came up with that song, and and you know that's it's kind of vague. And because it's based on just, you know, it's based on a thought. So it's not a my point there is it's not necessarily a a linear story or something that I'm writing about. It's an emotion. It's a thought. And you kind of write around that. Same with uh, didn't come this far for nothing. You know, that's not based on any one thing in particular. It's more of an idea. It's more of a concept. Honestly, with that song, we were thinking about the band. So it was like, hey, we've gotten this thing going again. We want to take this as far as we can go. We, we didn't come this far for nothing. Let's keep going. And so, you know, that song actually has some tongue in cheek lyrics, but it's all it's all centered around a, a concept, an idea. You know, so I think that's kind of what we do. There's a there's a thought, there's a concept and you, you build around it. And yeah, sometimes things are going to be more personal than than other times. Um there's no there's no one set way of writing lyrics either, you know. So there's a song on our first EP, Us Versus Whatever That Thing Is. And that's just like a made up story. That's about uh, I don't even know how I came up with that. Honestly, that song's about like a monster that comes and terrorizes a city. And I've had somebody ask me about that. Like, well, is that like a metaphor for something or what do you what is that? Like, no, it's literally about a monster that comes in terror. It's a it's just a fictional kind of thing I came up with. So there's no I know I'm kind of all over the place here, but there really is no like one set way of writing lyrics or 
it's all just what the song calls for, but I find that they tend to center around an emotion or a thought. Um, yeah, and I don't remember, was there another question before that? It was more like what sort of genre is your music? Because it struck me as kind of poppy, or maybe not poppy, a punk rock sort of thing. Maybe kind of pop punk, I think is what they call it, even though I think that's, I always tend to think that genre is kind of BS, but I think that's what <laughs> bands like Green Day and like some of those other bands like call themselves like these days, because it's like the whole post sort of punk scene, because the punks all seem to come in around the late 80s and 90s too. So is it sort of like a pop punk sort of genre? I kind of struggle with with the genre thing because we're definitely influenced by a lot of pop punk bands, a lot of punk band, you know, whatever you want to call it. I get you can really get in the weeds with these labels. You know, that's the, that's the other thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of 90s rock influence in what we do. Um, you know, bands like Foo Fighters and yeah, you mentioned Green Day. Green Day was a big influence on us, is a big influence on us. Um, there's also a lot of like classic rock in what we do, you know, um, actually in our vocal booth where we recorded for the, the, the vocals for our new EP, you know, we had a picture of uh, Paul Stanley from Kiss on the wall that just, just because we thought it was funny because we're, that's just kind of our sense of humor. So big picture of Paul Stanley just staring at us. Um, so there's some of that in there. Uh, you know, I don't really know what I would call us i just like to call us a rock band because i feel like we pull from a lot of different things we definitely um there's a lot of i would say we try to be melody driven so there's you know because there's also a, a power pop kind of influence in what we do but i guess if you had to break it down i don't know alternative rock you might be able to slip some of you know what we do you could maybe call it pop punk I don't know. Just call us rock. Let's just lump it all together in just one genre. Just lump it all together. But honestly, that's kind of what it is. Because when we're doing our songs, <clears throat> it's a lot of different things thrown in a blender. You know, so you might do something and it's like, yeah, this is kind of a punk song, I guess. But hey, this little part is influenced by something that's that's not punk necessarily. So... You know, and I think, too, when you when you call yourself, if you say we are a punk band and you are a band that has a lot of influences, you know, you're kind of putting yourself in a box because, uh, you know, OK, we're a punk band. So if we want to do this, are we able to leave the box and do this? You know what I mean? Like there's all it's almost like you're, you're giving yourself these self-imposed rules. And so I think. Yeah, there's definitely a lane that we are in, but we try to be careful about not really restricting ourselves too much. It's actually a very good point, too, because I think I've always dug, like, I, I think it's more of the progressives who tend to, like, branch out, like, maybe incorporate so much into their music. So, like, you'll do this one moment, then all of a sudden it jumps and does this. Maybe a time signature change, too. But then it's, like, maybe a bit more minor or major, whatever they want to go with. So you're definitely right. I think definitely trying to limit yourself to just like one particular genre kind of puts you in a little jail cell, if that's what we want to call it too. Yeah. And, uh, it's funny we mentioned about Paul Stanley too, because I was thinking, would you guys ever do a cover of Detroit Rock City? It's funny, you know, we we mess around with it when we're practicing. Uh, when we played some shows last year, I would slip in a few kiss riffs um, just, just for fun on stage in between songs. Um, as, as far as would we ever re like record a version of Detroit Rock City? Probably not, but I could definitely see us like messing around with it, busting it out live sometime. I mean, we always, when Adam and I, you know, middle school, when we met, we were both obsessed with Kiss. I mean, we were going through like a big classic rock phase at that time. And that was actually like our band for a while. We, we were all about Kiss, you know, so uh, that's, you know, that is in us and I could definitely see us, like I said, slipping that in, into a set sometime, maybe. I'd say anytime it comes on the radio, my dad instantly turns it up to like 10 and beyond just to hear that little intro rift as well. Yeah, yeah. No, great song. Yeah. But I think they always opened with Deuce before they came out with Destroyer. And then afterwards, it seemed to be Detroit Rock City was the opener going forward. I love Deuce as an opener. 
You, you know listen, your man is working hard. He's worth yeah, a deuce. But you listen to you listen to Kiss Alive. You know, uh, first song, Deuce, perfect opener. And uh, it always seemed like Black Diamond always seemed like the one they wanted to close with, but then they always had to come back on to do an encore afterwards. So yeah, no, Black Diamond though, another great song. I kind of wish they. I think when you listen to like the original, like how it comes off the CD, it's not as fun as how it should be. Because they don't do the explosions in the background too, which I think one of the bands, metal bands I listened to, Bathory, they did something like that. They did, I don't know how they did, but they must have brought in some sort of explosions or something, or something to simulate an explosion in the background too. So they did do something of how the breakdown normally goes with the Kiss song Black Diamond, when it starts doing like the theatrics near the end and everything too. So. Yeah, yeah, def- it's that de- it's definitely a different song live. That's for sure. I think a lot of them are, too, because I think, funny enough, I want to rock and roll all night. I think, funny enough, that one didn't have a solo in it, but during the live shows, there was always a solo that Ace 3 would play. So. Yeah, yeah, he added that in there, and then sometimes it feels weird going back and listening to the studio version without that solo. You know, it's like my mind, it's like I want it to be there. I'm expecting it to be there. Yeah, it seems like they could pop a little bit more, too, so it's more yeah. fun. So. I actually did get to see Kiss live, and that was actually pre-pandemic, which we'll get to in just a moment. But okay. I do remember that, and they did open with Detroit Rock City, and they did a lot of the big hits and everything too. You know, hundred thousand years, as they always did with Gene with the whole blood thing coming down. Oh yeah, actually no, I think he did that on God of Thunder. Actually, I think that's what the one he did there. But yeah. he did do hundred thousand years. Hundred thousand years usually had like the drum solo in it. Like, I think and it, it, and it, it felt like it went on for a hundred thousand years. By the way, that drum, <laughs> both literally and figuratively. <laughs> but uh, but he also did. Gene used to always do the little blood thing during a hundred thousand years when he would open with it. But I think he did. I think he did this time for God of Thunder because I think that's the one he always wanted to do it with. Yeah. The one thing I was a little ticked was they did not do Strutter. I wish they had done Strutter live. If you look at their set list, there's a lot of songs that I wish they would have done live. But uh, I guess I guess that's over now because now they're you know they're done touring and they've moved on to they're going to be doing those avatars they announced so I don't know what that's going to be all about but I know that uh, I guess that's the we've seen them for the last time in person. I'm going to call BS on that because they always seem to have a farewell tour or something like along those lines. The last the last damn show of this whole I know thing so I'm I think they're going to do something so it remains to be seen. We shall see. I guess let's go ahead and get to the serious subject of COVID first. So I guess first off, how did how bad did COVID impact you personally as well as the music and family? I mean, personally, I felt very fortunate because I never I never got it during, you know, the the I guess the peak of the pandemic. Um, I didn't really have any family that, that, that got it, at least nothing too bad. Uh, I was able to remain employed throughout. I worked from from home that whole time. So I I felt very fortunate. I think, you know, if anything, there was a little bit of a, as there was for for a lot of people, uh, it was more of a mental toll that it took on me. Um, In full transparency, you know, there were things that I, I don't want to say I liked about it, but I was you know, as somebody who does like to, you know, I can be a bit of a homebody. And so in lockdown, that gave you the perfect chance to be a homebody. But at the same time, I struggled with the mental aspect of, okay, but if I wanted to go do something, I can't, you know, right now I can stay home if I want, but I have the freedom to go do whatever I want if I want to leave the house. Whereas then you you couldn't and you didn't know how it was all going to end up. So you were just sitting inside kind of watching the world burn around you. And, you know, from a music standpoint, we weren't active at that time. And I didn't I didn't know if I was ever going to play music again. I wasn't really I wasn't really songwriting. You know, I have I, I had my guitar. I would pick it up and strum it here and there. But I didn't really know what was I didn't know if, if it was ever going to lead to anything. Um, but you know, enough time went by and in the back of my head, it made me want to get back with these guys. And it was like, cause it it showed that it could all be taken away just like that. 
And so it was like, as soon as we can, as soon as things start opening up and we can figure out how to make this band work, I want to get out there and play and put music out and just not take anything for granted and let's just do it. You know, so it gave it gave me that motivation. I already had it, but it just it just amplified it. They give you a nice kick in the rear end to kind of get out in the house and get back into doing it in the, way, in the manner of speaking. Yeah, because it's like, wow, look how quickly everything just shut down and, and went away. And it's like, so now we're just sitting here. Everything's kind of depressing. I kind of want to play music, I think. I kind of want to get back with my friends and play music and let's get out there and do this thing. You did mention earlier, you said COVID seemed to play a role in like how the music scene kind of went down a little bit. Was that what happened? I, th- I think so. Like I said, there are some venues that just weren't able to survive. And it seems like it seems like it used to also be easier to get shows booked, um, whereas now I think you have some venues are maybe a little more hesitant about who they have. Almost like, you know, they want to they want to guarantee, I think, that, OK, th- these these people are going to be a draw. You know, not that that didn't exist at all before, but I think that they were maybe willing to take more chances before. And, um, you know, and, and because because there are some you know less venues that can create kind of a bottleneck where now you're competing with these other bands to get these shows that where it was more spread out before, maybe a little easier to get get a show. Yeah, I don't know how bad COVID had impact because I'm from Pittsburgh, actually. So, but uh, I don't know how bad COVID had impact the music scene in my general area. But I know ours has been always been pretty diverse because I spoke with some folks who worked in like sort of recording studios, for instance. They said like how there's like such a dynamic of genres out there. In terms of like rap, rock, metal, and, like maybe some funky group that always it's like a crazy subgenre that just mixes a whole bunch of things together, but. I think COVID also really told people to just get up and live for some folks, I guess, especially maybe us musicians, too, because we realize maybe because I'm a drummer. So I think it's a lot harder when you're just trying to do it all on your own, too. If That's the only instrument, you know, you can't be like a one man band or anything like that, too. So I think it definitely opened up a lot of pathways, too. And it seems like it really helped out you guys as well. But I guess uh, did you guys have any brushes with COVID? Were you all okay? I, I I was fine, you know, speaking for myself. Like I said, I consider myself really fortunate that I really wasn't affected, I guess, medically during that time. Um, you know, I, I, I don't I don't want to speak for anyone else in, in the band, but, you know, we, we all made it through and and we're, we're here now. And that's I, I feel fortunate about that. That's very good to hear. It's good to have you guys along for the ride. Keep yeah. on rocking, brother. Absolutely. Okay. So I know you talked about the concert you guys are doing in uh, February. Are you guys just looking to stick in around Detroit? Or are you guys going to try to go in around the state of Michigan and maybe down to Indiana, maybe sneak over to Wisconsin or anything? You know, we'd like to we'd like to get around the, the area, definitely, like Ohio, Indiana, like like you mentioned. Basically, you know, the, the Midwest, that's probably what we'll stick to for now. Uh, we're, I think we're open. We're open to anything um, if the if the right opportunity presents itself. We just want to get out and play. You know, we do all work full time, so we have to balance that with with playing. So it's not it's not as easy for us to just get up and go and not you know not have to worry about it. But uh, you know, we're we're open and we're gonna we're gonna take it as far as we can and and play as much as we can. That's going to be cool. Can't wait to see what kind of shows you guys do. But I guess if do you guys also try to record any of your, I guess, live sessions that you guys do on like your social media or anything, too? Because that, that's where I checked out some of your songs was on a YouTube channel. Is that what you guys also try to do? Or are you just putting up your music strictly on YouTube? Um, Are we going to So you're you're asking, are we going to record live? I guess a video. I should say videotape live because. I actually got story of the year like last week and I was able to like record a good number of their songs that they had performed live, which was from their page Avenue album, which was released 20 years ago. Yeah. So they're celebrating 20 years, but you guys want to do that. So you guys show like how you guys perform live. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely want to get some more live footage. Um, 
for our shows in this this upcoming year. You know, um, last year, I think for us was kind of a comeback because we hadn't played live together in years. I mean, our shows last year were the first time we played in, in years. So we were just kind of finding our footing last year, I think. And now now we have more material um, to, to, to work with, more songs. We have Nick in the band. There's a, there's a new energy. There's a new focus and, and drive. And we want to just we want to flood everyone with lots of content. So yes, I think you'll be seeing, you'll be seeing some live footage for sure. All right. Can't wait to see it on YouTube channel, but I guess, uh, speaking of YouTube, I guess who handles all the social media? Is it you or does everybody have like an equal participation in it? We kind of divide it up, you know, so there's, there's no, there's not necessarily a set thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's basically just like, Hey, why don't you, we need to, we, we should post this. Can somebody post this? You know, that sort of thing. We have a, we have a group chat going, a group text that we all communicate in pretty much every day. So we're all in touch and it's just kind of whoever's able to jump in there and do it. All right. And uh, I guess, is there something you hope to achieve with YouTube channel or any of your social media channels in general? Well, interestingly, one of the things that Nick the, our, our new guitar player, you know, he he um, does photography and, and video for a living. And so that adds a new I, I guess it's a new door for us because, you know, we want to do a lot more with video and really try to build up that YouTube channel more. Um, you know, so we have plans to do more music videos, like I mentioned, um, live footage, and he's able to, you know, He's got he's got the equipment and he's got the editing skills where we can actually get more content out than ever before. So, yeah, like I said, I just keep going back to it. This is going to be 2024. There's going to be a lot of us. You're going to be seeing a lot of us, I think, content wise on YouTube and, and elsewhere. 2024 it is the year we get out there, people. That's right. Like that. Year of Cascade Riot. All right. Sounds good. Can't wait to see what you all got there. I guess, uh, how tough do you think it is doing multiple, I guess, if you want to say Cascade Ride is like your second job, I guess, how hard is it doing multiple jobs? Does it get stressful at times? You know what it is, is sometimes, sometimes you're a little tired and it feels like a lot, but it, at the same time, it's you, like for all of us playing in this band is what we love to do. So it's a labor of love. And if, you know, if we weren't doing it, we would miss it. So it's almost like, anything that you feel tired about it kind of gets canceled out because it's like yeah but we're but we want to be doing this we all talk about it when we're at our other jobs it's like we want to be doing this obviously you know most musicians can relate to that but this is our outlet this is this is our escape this is what we're thinking about when we're doing the, these other jobs so when we are able to do this yeah it can be a lot of work at times but we we wouldn't want to do anything else with our free time so you know, this is this is what we do. I think I brought this up in a couple of interviews where music and food, particularly like the pubs, the restaurants, and maybe those venues you play at that do have the live stages, they're always like the most essential things because the food and those entertainment venues, they provide the entertainment and they also help bring you out of your comfort zone and go have fun, for instance. And music, of course, it also helps you out too, both mentally and maybe a little physically too. Because yeah. for us drummers, since I'm a drummer as well, you tend to work out a lot more than probably what the guitarists and bassists are doing. Oh yeah, it's a it, that's a job back there, man. Just playing the drums. We'll look at Alex sometimes, and it's like, man, you okay? Because you know, it's like you you don't even think about it. It's funny because when we're rehearsing, we'll just throw songs out, and we're just we're just playing. We're not even necessarily always thinking about like he's got to sit there and just like keep going this whole time. Drummers are like the unsung heroes of you know, of bands, really. I think back then, I think in the 80s and 90s, I think chicks always dug the guitar player because they were always the ones playing the flashy solos and everything. Nowadays, I think it's the drummer, too. Yeah, no, go, kind of go for things. the drummer, people. Go for the drummer. He's the one who's keeping you in line. That's the thing. That's, I, boy, do I know that. <laughs> but actually, the point I was trying to get to was the jobs, unfortunately, with music and food and entertainment and stuff, they tend to be the most stressful and tend not to be... <sighs> At least the most rewarding in terms of like financially speaking. Mm -hmm. That's the unfortunate thing too, because you have so much fun doing it and it would be 
I think that's what most people would complain about because you also see some people who argue with like Spotify not paying their musicians or anybody fairly too. So right. it's an unfortunate thing too, but I guess, do you guys kind of face those challenges as well? Yeah. And I think, I think one of the biggest things that uh, in any band faces is lack of resources, right? Cause it's, yeah, everybody wants to do, you, you have all these ideas and things you want to do, but there, there are restraints. So you kind of have to work around that. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying, too. It's like, but there's there's really nothing else we'd want to do. So it's like, yeah, if we, if, we, if we have money, let's let's throw it at the band. Like, if we can, because why not, you know? You mentioned Spotify. I, I think especially, like, for a band like us where you're still getting your name out and everything, I mean, we're not even thinking about, at least I'm not, like, the compensation aspect of it. Would it be nice to be paid more for streaming? Sure. But this is, you know, it's 2024. Your people are going to be streaming your music and it's going to be it's going to be the way most people are hearing you. So to me, it, it, at least for the time being, you know, that's that's bigger than anything. You know, just having people hear the stuff. And like I said, we want to take this thing as far as we can take it. But, you know. We're also doing it because we love doing it. So I think we'd be doing it no matter what. That is ultimately what it boils down to. It's like making sure you're having fun while doing it too. Because it's like how the sports ones do. You go out, you have fun with it too. You still compete in a way because you want to say you're competing against those other rock groups who are trying to take the limelight away from you. That sort of thing too. But within good reason. Yeah. Say. Not very like physical or any sort of confrontations or anything like that. God Friendly. forbid. Friendly competition. Yes. Brotherly love, as we like to say, too, even though, even though <laughs> I always laugh with the term, too, because you think of Philly when they say city of brotherly love and it's they just watch the Philadelphia Flyers. It's like, no, that is not brotherly love. That's <laughs> physical confrontation. It's a good point. I never even thought about it like that. I always like to think of it as kind of like in terms of joking, like if I'm excuse my language, but if I'm fucking with you, that means I love you. That sort of thing, too. Yes. So, along those lines, too. But all right. So best of luck on your journey, both on the social media world and also whenever you guys get around to other shows as well as your one in February, too. So good luck to you, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're starting to book up a little bit. Um, you know, we had a few last year. We played. I don't know. We, we, we were lucky. We played in September opening for um, Billy Talent. That was probably the biggest show that we've ever played to this point. And um that was actually the moment we knew we wanted to get Nick in the band. We, uh, like I mentioned, he does video and photography. So we tapped him because he was a friend of ours. We tapped him to come be the photographer for that show. And uh, he, when he was hanging out with us, you know, both before and after the show, it, it, the, the chemistry just felt right. And, you know, I knew he was a guitar player. So it was kind of like at, at that moment, that show is when I realized we're going to end up pulling this guy into the band soon. I can feel it. But uh, anyway, I digress. Yeah. Actually, speaking of which, was he the one who put the music video for Chasing Stars? That was him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he also did I D- uh, Don't Want to Fall Asleep. He's in that video, but he helped set that whole thing up. He edited it. So, you know, he's 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 good to have around. Yeah. Now you guys got a free uh video producer who can now put music videos together for you guys <laughs> yep. shout out to nick yep thanks so much nick for putting that kick-ass music video together too but i guess what was the premise behind uh, chasing stars especially with how you guys were trying to do the whole music video because it seemed like you just find a message on a tree instead of a message in a bottle which they normally which is normally the metaphor but i guess what was the whole idea behind the chasing stars music video so the, the chasing stars music video is yeah, basically, I find this note, and deliberately, you don't know what's on the note, and I'm in search of something that I find at the end of the video. I'm satisfied with what I find, but, you know, you don't see what I find. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that because it's kind of a, an intentional cliffhanger. So when I mentioned about, you know, building the YouTube channel, I'll just say, I guess, stay tuned. I'll say it's almost... I always, I always thought it was going to be like that Gone with the Wind sort of moment, too. 
you happen to find <laughs> that woman at the end of the pier who happens to be the love of your life or something like that too. Or Romeo finds Juliet, that sort of thing too. Right, right. <laughs> it was all good in the end. Actually, I was a little surprised when I saw it too. I think like, oh, he found this bag. Actually, now that I think about it, it was almost like a Pulp Fiction sort of reference. Actually, if you had like a little box that looked like it was like holding money in it for something and the lights came on. And the lights, yeah. Oh, man, that would have been perfect. That would have been actually... <laughs> Actually, I think, unfortunately, it would have been, like, sort of an evil sort of symbolism, too, because it's meant to be, like, bright diamonds or a whole lot of money that just illuminates with, like, this hellish sort of glow to it. Yeah, yeah. No, that – and I think – I think, uh, yeah, it's hard to not think of Pulp Fiction when you think of, like, finding a bag or a briefcase or whatever because that scene is so iconic. So, I, you know, I thought about that, too. But – uh no, you know, we intentionally don't show what's in it. And you kind of, the video ends with me walking away. And I think we're probably going to pick up in another video. I think you'll be seeing that that bag again. So. Well, say, don't tell me that was your old high school book bag you used to carry back in the day. <laughs> no, that's actually, you know what that is? That's like an old uh, laptop kind of briefcase that I just found. It's like, oh, let's use this. This will work. Hey, yeah, we do what you got. <laughs> all right. Hey. hey, it worked. That's all that matters. So, all right. Shout out to Nick. Good job, Nick. Right. Yes. But I guess uh, speaking of the gear that you guys use for your production, and I guess also in terms of the guitar, bass, and drums that you guys use too. So I guess, can you walk us through what you guys got? Specific gear? Um, you know, for myself, I tend to record. God, I'm not picky when it comes to recording. So like on our newest EP, our, actually our drummer, Alex, you know, he, he has guitars because he also plays guitar on the side. And he just had a, he had a Les Paul that I was using. So I recorded most, if not all, of the guitar tracks using his Les Paul. Um, it was, it was actually Chasing Stars, you know, like the beginning of that one is played on a, on a Fender Telecaster that I have. So that has a blend of, of guitars on it. Um, you know, Adam has multiple bases that, that he uses. Alex, same thing. He just got a new drum set. So, you know, I'd have to, I'd, I'd, I'd rather them speak about their gear speaking for myself though. Yeah. This, our newest stuff is recorded with a Les Paul. I have a strat that I like to use live a lot, which is just kind of like a custom, um, one humbucker strat. But I'm not, th that's the thing we always laugh with in the band because I'm not a big gearhead. To me, um, you know, I just want to find a guitar that sounds decent. I want to get out there and just play. I don't like messing around with all this. I mean, because you can get, it can get messy and th things go wrong. And I just, I don't like the headache of a lot of it. I was to say, yeah, I think I mentioned about a concert I went to last week, which was with Story of the Year and two other groups. I think I kind of, I want to say maybe like three guitar swap swaps they always did between like songs, for instance, too. So I think I, I think I could see what you mean with like being a headache with like jumping between guitars. It's just honest. yeah, I mean, it's just it's more to think about. And it's like I just I just want to play, man, you know, like I don't. So but, you know, guitar players, they're, the gearheads are out there and more more power to them because there's a lot there's a lot of interesting gear. It can be a fun thing to dive into. It's just it's just something that I'm not really interested in. So give me give me some good guitars, a decent amp, and just let me play. That's kind of that's kind of where I'm coming from. Hey, simplicity is key when it comes to it. Yeah. When you think about it as well. But I guess who puts the whole music together, and I guess also does the mixing and mastering. Is it you or is somebody else, or do you guys all share the responsibility? I mean, we so we do record ourselves, and most of the recording. Um, well, I would say it's actually Alex, our drummer, that he's the one that's doing the, the mixing and the mastering. So, you know, we're lucky to have a, that's he's another good resource to have in house, you know, to, to be able to do that kind of stuff for us. And we, we self everything we've done to this point has been self-produced. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I like about us is that we don't we don't get hung up on I think self-producing can be an issue if you don't know how to self-edit. You know, you have to be willing to say this idea is not working or you know, this is okay, but we should really shorten this part or or whatever. 
and we, you know, and we, we do that within their time. We'll record a song and just we're not feeling it and we'll just scrap it completely, even though we've put work into it because we're, we don't feel that it's that it's good enough or it doesn't match the vibe or, or whatever. So I think, you know, I, I like how we self-produce things. But from a from a technical standpoint, most of that is Alex, our drummer, doing the mixing and the mastering and the actual recording part of it. Did he go to music school in order to like learn how to mix and master, or did he kind of have to hop on what I call YouTube University in order to like study mixing and mastering from like other people who've done it? He just he just he just knows. He just he has a good ear. He's able to learn and pick up on things quickly. He's uh he's always trying to think of ways to you know improve. And um, I I don't know. He picked up on that. He's all he's been in the recording for years. I mean, going back when again when we were younger, I remember him first starting to get into that. Like when we were in high school, it was just something he was interested in. And over the years, he's gotten better and better. It's something he likes to do. And, you know, I I think it sounds, you know, he does a really good job. I was like, yeah, it definitely sounded killer. So give him huge props right there. Al, yeah, big Alex. Al. Yep. Guy came through. That guy deserves a raise or something like that. Yeah. I'd be like, you, my friend, got some potential, that sort of thing. <laughs> a big, That's big old pat on the back, buddy. Actually, give him a good slap on the back, too, from yeah. me. Just tell him that's a way of saying hi, too. <laughs> I will. But I guess, uh, what sort of DAW does he use? Do you ever see which one he uses at all? Is it like Reaper or Logic? Uh, we use Cubase to record. <laughs> that turns out pretty well. well. Let's say I've used Logic a good bit, but I guess, is he more of a Windows guy or a Mac guy? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I'm drawing a blank on that for some reason, which is weird because it's like I'm, I'm looking at the screen a lot, too, when we're recording. Um, I, don't, I guess I don't want to. I know he has a Mac. He does a lot of the editing on the Mac. Um, we've used Windows for recording. I know there's a whole school of thought there, like what's better for recording and doing media versus this and that. Um, my memory tells me that we've used both. But uh, I can tell you definitively that we we do record using Cubase. Yeah, I'd say whatever floats your boat or the one you feel the most comfortable with, I think, is what ultimately boils down to. Because <laughs> I always have to laugh because I think when people want to get to like into music, for instance, or music production, they're always going to look up that question and be like, which one's the best DAW? And it's almost like, yeah, just find the one that you're comfortable with. But I think the price also scares them away, too. So I think that's why most, let's just say, noob music producers Sure. They don't want to use like Pro Tools unless they're like dead serious, to be honest. Yeah, and for me, I I just show up, you know. Like I said, it's it's him doing the recording stuff, so it's like let me do my parts, okay? You you uh you handle it from here, dude. So luckily, it's nothing that I have to really think about too much. Yeah, afterwards you're just like, okay, there it is. You do what you want with it. I'll see you in a week. You're saying, like, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes back and be like, that's so badass, man. What'd you do? <laughs> Actually, is that what you almost do? It's be like, when you hear it, it's like, what the hell did you do, man? That sounds killer than what it originally sounded like. I've had that reaction with pretty much everything we've done because, you know, it's like you, when you're recording, when you're recording the way we do it just at home, you know, we're, a lot of times we're just plugging straight in and we do it and it's like i've done my part i go off and live my life and then he meanwhile he's back there putting it all together and he'll send out a rough mix and it's like whoa you know that's always that's always my favorite thing is when you're recording and then you start to get those mixes back and you hear the whole thing actually coming together because you, you don't always know how it's going to turn out when you're recording but then when you hear those mixes coming together and it's working it's like ah yes you know, it's just it's just such a great feeling when it's actually working and you hear it all together. It's like the perfect story just suddenly came together. We had the climax and now we've reached the falling action sort of moment. Yeah, something like that. It is like that. Yeah. But I guess in terms of like how you guys create your songs, for instance, do you normally make the music first and then write the lyrics or vice versa? I tend to because I uh, yeah, I tend to do the music first. 
usually what happens is I'll have a guitar and I'll just be kind of, you know, st uh, strumming and something. I'll land on an idea and then I kind of hum a melody and, you know, which is usually just it, it's either me humming or singing gibberish or whatever. But I have a melody and I have a structure. And so I can then go back and fill it in with lyrics. I know some people will write lyrics first. I tend to not do that. I tend to, I like to have the song and kind of a melody, something to work with. And then I can go and fill that in with lyrics afterwards. And so I'll do that. Usually what happens is I'll record a rough demo on my phone or something, send it to the guys and you know they'll say yeah this is this is cool and then we'll get together and work on it and that's where you know maybe the arrangement might change or we'll we'll flip some things around but that's that's at least how they start so it starts with an idea and then afterwards it blossoms into something more so. and that's always an awesome feeling too you know that's i think that's one of the great things about being in a band really is when you have an idea and then the other guys in the band just take that idea and make it better because it's it's just it's great you know i like i like everybody's input and i always say it's like because i do tend to write most of the songs but i want them to come in with their ideas and and you know add their parts to it and suggest things and make it a band effort i mean yeah and uh yes you guys try to also mess around with the lyrics too like maybe you'll write maybe the whole song first to be like no let's try something like this like what alex and nick will do um i would say that i as far as lyrics go those are usually all coming from me uh so i'll come in with the song you know i'll have the basic song that's always the case but then they'll take that song and just it's usually their ideas tend to be more musical ideas or arrangement ideas but, you know, we had a song, we have a song on our EP coming out called Cobwebs that was an idea that Alex had. He had the music idea for it. Um, it wasn't it wasn't finished, but he, he had the idea. Um, and I came in and we worked on it together and we finished it together. I wrote the lyrics, but uh, he, he had the uh, initial idea for that song. So there's no... There's no, you know, set way of doing things. There doesn't have to be a set way. I thought one of your EPs was going to be Life on Venus because when I was checking out your Facebook page, I thought that said Life on Venus was coming out on uh, one thirty this year. Life on Venus, yeah, that's our new EP. It will be out on January thirtieth. Is Cobwebs a part of that whole EP I as well? It will be a part of, yeah, that's on Life on Venus. Okay, so I guess do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Do a little self promotion right now. <laughs> Shameless self promotion. Yeah, so we've. Uh, we this is we're really proud of this EP because we feel like it just feels like an like an evolution, which is almost like a cliche thing to say, but um, it it really does. Again, it's nothing radical. We're still staying within kind of the framework that we stay in, but we're really expanding on it. And there's just different textures and layers to it that that I think are not present or as present in our earlier stuff. And it's really, you know, it's why we asked Nick to join the band. We actually recorded the majority of the EP as a trio. And it was at the end of the recording that we asked Nick to come in. So most of the EP, he's not on. But we realized we realized playing live, we're going to want another guy there. And then, you know, going forward when we record, it'll be nice to, to have him in the band. But uh no, as far as the songs themselves, we're, we're super stoked to get these out. Like you mentioned, Chasing Stars, we just released that. That'll be on the EP. That's kind of a, that's somewhat of a departure for us, at least compared to, you know, when you listen to our other stuff, there's really no other songs like that. And, um, you know, just, yeah, I mean, just super, super excited. That's all I can say. This, that's what keeps coming to mind when, when you ask me about it. Hey, anytime you do some sort of promotion, it's always exciting news, to be honest. So can't wait to yeah. see it. So this is all coming out this month on 130, 2024? Yes, 130, okay. 2024. Mark it down, people. Yep. So I guess we're going to go to check it out. Is it going to be on all the major platforms and everything? 
It'll be on all the major platforms, and we're going to be working on. There will be there will be a physical release. Um, we're still working out the details of that, but there will be um, multiple ways of hearing it. But yes, it will be on all of the the major platforms. All right, sounds good. You heard it from this guy right here, so make sure you go check it out, folks. All right, so I think I had mentioned this earlier in terms of influences too, but normally it was one of the questions. So would you say? I know you mentioned about the classic rock artists and I guess some of the pop punk sort of bands like Green Day and those other ones too. Was there any other people who had influenced you in terms of your guitar style as well as your vocal style? Vocal style? Um, you know, like I mentioned, Foo Fighters. Uh, people will people will compare us to Foo Fighters sometimes. And yeah, I know like Dave Grohl was an influence on me as a songwriter and I think also as a vocalist probably. Um you know, another another big influence is, like I said, we try to be, um, I try to be melodic. So there's a lot of like Beatles in there too. You know, like I'm always trying to slip little things in there. It might not be obvious, but we'll be recording and it's like, we should we should add a little harmony here. And I think, you know, in my head, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking of Beatles because it's just such a, you know, like I said, when I was a little kid, they're one of the bands that really got me into wanting to play music. And so that's kind of my point, too. It's, it's all it's all such a blend of things, man. Like I don't have I can't tell you like, yes, I'm influenced by this, this and this because there's just so much, you know, that, that I couldn't even begin. I would say. Yeah, Green Day and Foo Fighters, when people talk about us, those are the ones that tend to come up the most. Um, and they definitely are influenced and have, have been influences on me musically, vocally, I guess. But there's just there's just so much. Yeah, that's the one view of music, too. They give you a plethora of artists to choose from as well, depending on like which genre you tend to listen to a whole lot as you're growing up or even like starting out as a kid, for instance. So, yeah. And you know what else? I want to give a shout out to, to just in general, there's a lot of uh, really great underground bands right now. And, you know, you listen to these bands and it's like, you always hear the argument of, well, you know, rock is dead. And it's like, it's really not, it's really not. If you, you know, and you would know talking to musicians, it's just, it's, it's out there. And it's that whole thing of, yeah, it's, it might be harder to find. You got to look for it, blah, blah, blah. but it is out there. And, um, you know, this new stuff we were doing, I mean, I was influenced by a lot of, a lot of just the, the underground bands that are going right now, you know, um, you just hear bits and pieces of it and it's like wow there's still fresh ideas out there and there's still people putting their hearts into it and it might not be you know things might not seem obvious if i gave you a song and said you know listen to this this was influenced by so and so but things seep in you know and and also just like i think also the spirit of things can seep into what you do you know i get inspired by i just like everything around me, you can find inspiration in, in everything. That's the thing. And that's why I struggle to really narrow it down to, well, oh, I'm inspired by this and this and this, because it's, it's really everything. I can go to a concert and see some band I've never heard of and just be completely inspired by, by a performance that they've done. And inevitably that might work its way somehow into something that I do. It's just if you if you have if you have your mind open and you're paying attention to, to to everything, there's a ton of things to be influenced and inspired by. Well, so you definitely struck me as a guy who also liked listening to the alternative rock that grew up. I guess we could say that it was the late '90s and going into the 2000s there too, because I know I mentioned Story of the Year earlier. So you struck me like you would be the one who would listen yeah. to like a bit. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think if you listen to us, look, you can hear a lot of like 90s rock influence in, in what we do. And that's all there, you know. And uh, I mean, geez, I'm, there's some Nirvana in there. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there. I love a lot of like Stone Temple Pilots that just that kind of that whole era. I feel like there was a lot of stuff going on. But then you move you move later down the line. There's a lot of you know, Blink-182 shows up sometimes in, in things we do. Um, really, you know, a lot of sonically, there's a lot of th a lot of influence from, like I said, the 90s, kind of into the early 2000s that 
alt rock, punk, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I don't see it. Like I said, I'm just thinking right now of a lot of these newer bands that I've that I've become aware of recently. And it's like to me, I'm just as influenced by them as I am that stuff. So and that's kind of my point. It might not be as obvious, but it's in there. And I think we all try to kind of keep our ear to the ground and allow ourselves to be influenced by everything that's going on around us. Absolutely, too. And I guess would you also say that's your advice? To like other indie musicians in our little band, com- band together community on Facebook? Yeah, I would say definitely if I had advice, first of all, I would say keep going. You know, that's the first thing, because like you mentioned earlier, it can be kind of thankless and it, it can seem like maybe it's going nowhere. But it, it, ultimately, it's like if if you're doing it because you love doing it, just keep going. Don't even worry about how many people, how many clicks you're getting, how many views, wh- whatever, just keep doing it. And, and I think that if you, if you, if you love it, you believe in it and you keep doing it, you know, that's, that's kind of the reward. The reward is built in, but ultimately the, the audience will find you if you just keep going, just keep going. And then I would say also, yeah, allow yourself to be influenced by just everything going on around you, you know, um, I keep referring to this lane we stay in because we definitely have a sound and a style. But I mean, I'm influenced by, you know, I was listening to, uh, what was I listening to the other day? It was like an indie, indie pop sort of artist that the type of thing I wouldn't normally listen to, but it was really cool. And it's like, I heard things in there that, hey, maybe I could, you know, the wheels start turning, incorporate some of that into what we do. doesn't mean that I'm going to become that style, but how can you fuse ideas from that into into what we do, into our style? So, you know, if you are a metal band, I would say it's like, well, you don't just have to, you know, of course you're a metal band, you listen to metal, but you don't have to stay in that box. You can you can listen to other things, you know, and you can allow that stuff to seep in and it's just going to make what you do more interesting. Absolutely, too. It always seems like the best advice always happens to be the most cliched sort of advice when you think about that, too. So it seems it seems obvious, but, you know, I'd be there's a lot of people like I have friends that that will listen to, to punk music and it's like it becomes their identity and it's all they listen to and anything else sucks and. It's like, I, if you really feel that way, you know, because I can't tell people what, what to like and what not to like, fine. But I just, speaking for myself, it's like, you can you can have your main thing, but there's a lot going on, you know? And at the end of the day, if you take the genre thing away from it, what is it? It's all just music. We can label it whatever we want, but it's all just music. And so I would say just allow yourself to absorb all of this stuff because there's a lot of great stuff going on i would say i think people always like a certain groove when it goes to it too because i think if you're because i talked about some of the metal bands too and some of those guys more so in the technical sphere tend to go a little all over the place too it's like it sounds like it's all jumbled it's like a little cacophony going around lyrics don't sound so coherent it's probably all jumbled and everything too they can sound like a dog barking randomly too <laughs> so you can say what i mean too i think for most people they would want you know that sort of like nice group where they're able to like feel it for instance so yeah. i think that's what most people would say they love most about music too but i don't think i sent you this one but i guess what is it that you love most about music i love the the freedom of it i mean as a musician i can speak as a musician you know it's like it's kind of what i do you know some people some people paint and some people play sports or whatever and i've always just played music and that's how i express myself and so it's nice to have that as an outlet, as a musician, as a listener. It's just the, the feeling that I get from listening music. I don't I don't get it from anything else. So I can get a song stuck in my head and it's like it's the it's the greatest drug there is, man. I mean, I love having songs stuck in my head. I'm walking around all day just thinking about music. So music to me is just it's kind of what keeps me going. It's like it's as important to me as anything, and it, and it always has been. Let's have high on life. We're now high on music. So yeah. I, we're high on pretty much anything these days. 
<laughs> yeah, but I, you know, and, and again, that's another cliche, but, you know, high on music, but it's also true, you know, I mean, there's, there's nothing else that gives me the feeling that, that music gives me. That's for sure. Yeah. So I guess let's talk about the band together group real quick and then we'll get to the fun questions right afterwards. So I guess, uh, when did you guys join band together? Did you just recently join? Um, on Facebook, what was that? That would have been last year. I want to say that was around the time that we released Page Not Found, our EP, back in the, the spring. You know, just trying to get out there and connect and get the name out there and and uh, see what we could do. Sorry about we were still going there. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to think back on exactly when that happened. But I think that that was... You I can't do awkward silences. That's the thing. We got to avoid the awkward silences. <laughs> I want to say that was the time period. Uh, I see. Actually, I stumbled upon it recently. I think it was after I had interviewed Christina and Greg when they told me about the whole Bandy Guy group that they had, they had formed, and now it's over 7,000 members. So that's how I was lucky to find you guys. But I think it was because you or somebody else had responded to one of my posts that I put up. And I think it was the one, I Don't Want to Fall Asleep. That's when you guys recently released it or something like that. So. Yeah, we released I Don't Want to Fall Asleep. What was that? Early December. It was definitely in December, yeah, because I, I, I think I was trying to, <laughs> I don't want to say, I should say self congratulate myself, but I was also trying to promote the podcast out to everybody, too. So Yeah. So. Well, you got right? I mean, come on. You can self-promote, too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying here too. It's not as easy as it looks. So, but we're trying too. You also got to do like those little reels and all those little short videos and everything these days. Yeah. Which is un it's unfortunate, but unfortunately, that's people don't have the long attention span as they used to anymore. So, it's all it's all part of the game, right? Unfortunately. So, what are you gonna do? You just gotta survive, adapt, and overcome. There we go. Yep. So. We talked for a good bit here, Ryan. So I guess let's go ahead and jump to the fun questions. And then we got one more after that. So ready? Let's go. All right. So first, the fun questions, I guess, what would you consider as your favorite food? You know what I love? I love Mediterranean food. So like like, like the garlic and the pita bread and the, the, the I, I love lemon oregano chicken. I know this is very like specific, but it's something that like I get a lot when I go to these places and it's. It's just like my favorite kind of food, the grape leaves, the hummus, all that stuff. And then I, I mean, I like pizza. Who doesn't love pizza, right? I mean, that's, come on. Um, tacos. I don't know. What don't I like, man? That's to say, hey, if it tastes good, just go ahead and eat it. That's the thing. <laughs> the or at least whatever you're in the mood for, yeah. Yeah, I'm just about to sit here and just list off 50 foods for you. You know what I'm actually thinking about right now? I could go for some Indian food right now. It just popped into my head. I don't know if I tried too much of Indian food, to be honest. So I guess what sort of Indian food did you have in mind? I like if you get a good vindaloo or a, a good korma, some naan bread. Come on, man. That's that's living. I don't think I ever had that. No, never had that, to be honest. I have to start branching out at some point. Otherwise, it's time. Yeah. Whenever we eventually reach out to Lower Asia or Southeast Asia or India, for that matter, yeah. Whenever we get to it, maybe that's where we'll try it out. Because I don't think there's too many. I think there's maybe a couple Indian restaurants out of my neck of the woods because they always seem to like diversify a little bit here and there in terms of like the restaurants they have. So. Yeah, well, luckily, it, luckily in in where we're at in the Detroit area, there's just it's a good spot for for food. If you're into food, it's actually I don't know if people would think of that actually that aren't from Detroit, but. It's super diverse, and there's just tons of anything you could want everywhere. Yeah, it's the beauty of the restaurant chains. You just know how to cook, put up a store somewhere, and then just advertise and try to make sure you put it on a good busy street. That's a big thing, too. You got to always yeah. have a busy street so you stand out. So, yeah, that's all good. But for the next one, uh, what is your favorite movie? Oh, man. I always go back and forth. There's a few that stand out, um, like the original Star Wars movies, which those it can alternate which one is my favorite based on on the day, really. Like right now, I'm actually a big fan of Return of the Jedi of the original Star Wars movies, which people always put down. But like, I love that movie. You know, I think it's I think it's awesome. I always thought it was awesome. And then Forrest Gump is one that stands out. Um 
Spinal Tap. Love Spinal Tap. And you mentioned Pulp Fiction earlier. I would list Pulp Fiction as one of my favorites. So, I don't know. I can't really narrow it down, but it would be one of those, I think. It's funny about the Star Wars one because, uh, yeah, I did used to watch the VHS tapes way back in the day as well. And uh, I would say it was here between New Hope and Return of the Jedi. I didn't give Empire Strikes Back a lot of credit when I was young back in the day. I think no matter that, they're like... Empire Strikes Back is kind of like the critic's choice, you know, of of those original Star Wars movies. And um, don't get me wrong, I love it, but it was never, like, my favorite. I was kind of with you. It was always, like, New Hope or Return of the Jedi. I think it was because the bad guys won, or we didn't actually notice the huge plot twist was so what's the word symbolic or anything like that too or like i am your father yeah no and it's definitely it's definitely the most like serious of in tone of those early the original star wars movies so i guess it didn't appeal to me as much as a kid either but um yeah but they're all great come on you can't go wrong with any one of those you know people recently started to talk about the prequels a lot more now because I know there was like maybe a little criticism with like more so the writing of anything. Now it's like, okay, I think some of the things would make sense. Were we a little too harsh with like criticizing it back then or something like that? I I think that no matter what they did for those prequels, there's no way that it, they were ever going to live up to the original ones. It's like they, those prequels could have been the greatest movies of all time. And it was like, I so they were kind of in a way dead on arrival, but you know, to your point, I think enough time has gone by now where people that grew up with the prequels, now the nostalgia is there for those. So you can kind of reevaluate it. And, you know, they're not, look, they're not, they're not as great as the originals, but there's, there's some okay stuff in there, I think. I would say Attack of the Clones. Yeah, that one was a pretty good one. I'd yeah. say that was, I would feel that was the best out of the three pre- prequels. What, I was at sequels. <laughs> well, what did you think of, uh, you know, the most recent ones. Uh, do you mean the TV shows? They seem to be coming out of a good number of them, too. But no, you're just talking no, about the... not the, the movies, the ones the the Star Wars movies that, that Disney has put out, like. Um, like Force Awakens and, and those. Did you see the new the new Star Wars movies? I did. Yeah, just because I wanted to see, like, OK, where are they going with this? And the problem was, like, after The Last Jedi, it was almost like. Are we really still trying to pan this whole thing out, to be honest? Yeah. It felt like Return of Jedi was a good spot maybe to just say, like, okay, there's maybe some remnants of the Empire, but let's just go and kick their asses and call it a day. So, yeah. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't too crazy about it. Nothing against, like, the actors or anything. I've actually, think, I think I've seen, like, a couple of things. I think one was called The From. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, too, but there was a little book series that they written in the 90s, which was about... I think it was a empire general who became like the admiral of like the whole empire who apparently was, he was wicked smart and very good at what he was doing. And he almost would have won, but he made a little mistake here, which cost him his life. So a lot of people would say that was perhaps the nice cannon there. And then I think after that, there was what was called dark empire and those, so there was a book series and dark empire was a comic series. It seemed to also focus on Luke and then like how he briefly turns to the dark side briefly. And there's a whole lot of other things involved there, but I think people would say the fraud in this Dark Empire would have been more the canon for sequels series, to be honest. Yeah, it's a whole universe, man. And I never jumped into like the comics and, and, and all of that. It was just honestly, it seemed overwhelming whenever I would like because there's just so much there, you know, when it comes to canon and, and whatnot. But uh, the movies themselves, I thought the most recent ones, I thought I thought they were OK. I think that's kind of the most I can say about it, though. It's like, they're all right. But yeah, they kind of milked that. They milked the original, I guess, story for all they could. But uh, I mean, we just destroyed the Starkiller base doing the same thing. We just somehow flew in there. We just blew up the reactor in the middle of it all. And then it was just one big explosion after that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how it went. Um, but yeah, nothing. Those originals, come on. To me, those are still the those are the best Star Wars movies. Let's. No argument. Actually, I think the one that would compete in terms of seriousness and dark tone would be Rogue One. I would say that one was at least pretty good. Rogue cool. One. That was actually, yeah. Oh, and that last, the last when Vader's at the end of Rogue One. That's an awesome scene. That's he turned actually, off all the lights. I didn't notice that, too. The whole lights on his vest or anything else 
he had turned it off. So it, it means that he didn't really need the whole vet, his whole suit overall. So that was actually kind of funny. Yeah, that scene, though, when he's just tearing it up at the end there, that's like when I was a kid, that's like what I wanted from Vader, you know, because you didn't really see that from him in those original movies. So to see him actually just annihilate everybody like that it was awesome. I think they were kind of limited in the originals way back in the 70s there, yeah, too. Yeah, so. they, definitely, they definitely were. But I'm, I'm glad we have something like that now. Yep, so we'll see what happens as well as where they're going with the TV shows. I think they... I just want to say it's like a mixed bag because I think Mandalorian kind of got hit hard a little bit with like this and that because it got involved in like... I think I think maybe unintentionally, but it kind of got involved in the political side, unfortunately, or at least well, got pulled into it. Yeah, I'm also a little... I'm just kind of a little burnt out. Like, I love the movies, but, you know, it's a lot to keep up with, too, when it, with all this other stuff. I mean, that's it's the same as like... Uh, you know, the Marvel stuff. It's like, you, there's just, there's a, I think there's a fatigue that sets in too. It's like, there's just so much stuff you have to, that you're, that you're asked to keep up with as a viewer. And it's like, all right, I just kind of need to back away from this because there's too much going on here. You ain't lying. So we'll see what happens, but good choices for the movie, movie wise too. So, uh, for the next one right here, uh, first off, do you drink by any chance? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite alcoholic drink and non-alcoholic drink? Favorite alcoholic drink is I like a good old-fashioned. So and then when it comes to like liquor, I'm I guess I'm a whiskey and bourbon kind of guy. Um, but yeah, old-fashioned, like as far as a cocktail goes. And then as for non-alcoholic, I I kind of boring drink, just kind of drink a lot of water. Like I have this is Lacroix peach pear LaCroix, which I never liked. I never liked sparkling water, you know, and then, and then one day I just kind of not minding, like I'm, I'm kind of okay with it now. So like I'll reach for one of these, um, within the band, you know, Nick, he likes to pound a bunch of Coke zero. I like a Coke zero, but that guy, that guy's keeping, (laughs) I mean, He's he's emptying shelves with his Coke Zero consumption. So, um, yeah. So I won't get into all all the other guys, but that's that's what I like. Instead of like having the thirty packs of Bud Light or Miller Light, he has thirty packs of Coke Zero. All the stuff. Yeah, that was, yeah I, I'm down with Coke Zero. I think it's fine. I think I do notice the taste a little bit too, because I think it was the sugar that always made it pop real well. I think that's what it was, or something like that. But I digress. I mean. Everyone wants to try to eat healthy, but unfortunately, the alternatives don't really seem to do much, which is unfortunate. But yeah, that well. The reason why I asked earlier if you do drink is because sometimes uh-huh. during like the interviews, there's a uh, some people who said that they gave up drinking because they happen to be like raging alcoholics mm-hmm. sometimes too. So just no. a word of advice: just drink responsibly. Yeah, absolutely. Saying. Nothing, nothing like that. But I do like a, I do like a good old fashioned. Sounds good. Maybe one day we'll have a nice little drinking. Or get together at one of the pubs and have a nice Let's little drink it. together. So I'll make it happen at some point. And then for the last of the fun questions, uh, what is currently your favorite song? Oh, currently. Um, so I'm actually going through a little bit of like a Bob Dylan phase right now. Um, like his mid 60s period. So this is because of the movie that they're coming out with. Is is that what you've been seeing? No, no, it's actually not. I don't know. I don't know how I got into this Bob Dylan kick, but I'm in it. And I would say like subterranean homesick blues is a song of his that I've been listening to a lot lately. But then also, um, aside from Bob Dylan, there's this band out of Ohio called equipment. They have, uh, an album, called Alt Account that came out. And really, it's that whole album I've been listening to. And yeah, those are those are kind of like my 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 two artists of of the moment, I would say. That's pretty good, yeah. And uh, actually, is Equipment, that band you talked about out of Ohio, are they an indie group or have they been around a while? They're, they're a newer kind of indie group. I'll have to check them out at some point, see if we get them on the channel, or see if they are in the band to get a group. So yeah, we'll see what should. happens. You should. All right. Sounds good. So, Ryan, we're reaching in my podcast right here. We are down to one more question. And we actually talked, I think after editing and everything, too, it's going to be a little over an hour and 20 minutes. But 
Uh, did you have any questions for me or any final words you want to say before we jump into the final question? You know what? I think what you're doing is great. I would ask, what? so what is your motivation? What got you interested in talking to all these bands and artists? Well, I needed something to actually diversify my YouTube channel for one thing, because I was doing drum covers originally. And unfortunately, you're in a saturated market when you're doing that sort of stuff. But at the same time, I also had a real bad stint in sales. I realized that I wasn't really as extroverted as I thought I was, even though I was like, you are probably also memorizing lines to try to like sell a product to somebody. But that kind of was a awakening for me there too. And, I, and I've always been meaning to actually podcast for a while, but I don't know why I kept putting it off. And because of the whole thing with COVID, I just decided, all right, let's just give it a try and see what happens. And looking back on now, having these sorts of talks, they help me interact with people a little bit more. And I think also too, when the channel does become big at some point, it also helps out these musicians as well helps them get exposure so that people can go check out your music on whatever platform it is. But also it's a good benefit too, because it helps break down my walls of being an introvert to say the least. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a good point because for bands, you know, something like this didn't exist 20 years ago, you know, you'd have to go through traditional media or whatever to, to land an interview. And so now social media, YouTube, just the internet in general, what it is now, having people like you doing what you do, and you know, it helps bands out so much. So it's a, I hope you know it's appreciated. That's what I want to do. I want to help out as best I can. So we'll see what happens. It will be nice to eventually monetize the channel at some point. I would say there's at least a selfish reason why. <laughs> well, of course. Why not? Why not? Well, why not? I got I got to pay bills, man. I got bills to pay. But uh, did you have anything else, or is it okay we jump to the final question? We can jump. All right, sounds good. So given what COVID has done, obviously it seems like you guys have been pretty blessed. No sort of issues or anything like that, too. Uh, but for those who have been impacted pretty much greatly or whatever from COVID and everything else, too, what sort of message of hope could you give to musicians and people out there as we try to move forward in a post-COVID world? I think just... Kind of like what I said earlier, if you love if you love what you're doing, just keep doing it, because we saw with the lockdowns and everything that happened, how quickly it can all go away. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And so if you have this thing you love doing and, you you know, I don't like the idea of somebody that has talent and loves what they're doing, loves to play music and they just never leave the bedroom and aren't they don't want to put themselves out there for whatever reason and it's like as long as we are able to get out there and play and put this stuff out there like let's do it put yourself out there so just just you know do it do it for the right reasons but but get yourself out there that's the thing and and you know you never know what tomorrow is going to bring so as long as you have today make the most of it to quote Harvey Kettle, spoken like a true prodigy <laughs> from Pulp Fiction. So, all right, sounds good. And thank you so much for sharing those words of advice there, Ryan. It really means a lot. So, Absolutely. All right. So, Ryan, we've reached the end of my podcast right here. And boy, oh boy, we talked pretty much a good hour and 20-some minutes here. So this is going to be pretty damn good. But uh, did you have any final words or any shout-outs you want to give before we close? No, I think we, I think we covered a lot of ground. I would just... I would say again, uh, Cascade Riot, Life on Venus, new EP out January 30th. Check it out. All right. You heard it from this guy right here. So, everyone, my guest today was Ryan Fela, hailing from Detroit, Michigan. Also, I forgot to give a shout out to the Detroit Lions in the playoffs. So, good luck there, Nate. Actually, I did have Sam Laporta and Jameer Gibbs in my fantasy. They started off a little bit rocky, but they turned it around. They helped me out. I came in third in my fantasy league. So, I give a big shout out to Sam Laporta and Jameer Gibbs. There you go. Shout out. All right. Sounds good. (laughs) And uh, he's part of the band Cascade Riot. And uh, he's got the new EP, as he mentioned, right here, as well as the music on all the major platforms and everything, too. I think I did ask earlier, but I guess, so what other social media can people reach out and see you guys on? You know, on Facebook and Instagram? From Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or I guess X. No, I still get I get tripped up on that. I don't think I'll ever not call it Twitter. Um we're, you know, we have a TikTok. We're all over the place. So if you just you look us up, you should be able to find us. You should have said that. You should have just called it Tweety Bird or something like that too. 
I, you know what? I think that changing it from Twitter to X was, I, I don't, I don't get that at all, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I I'm not going to get involved in that too. I don't really use X all that much, even though I have it on my phone, but I, I just don't really care about it anymore. So you'd be able to do what you want on it. So, yep. We're on, we're on there for anybody that does care. All right, but, we're, but we're, we're everywhere. So you you can look us up and find us. And if you happen to be in the Detroit area or anywhere in the Michigan area and you see these guys coming to your neck of the woods, go check them out. These guys are going to kick some major ass. Yes, be there. All right, sounds good. So, Ryan, I want to wish you guys Happy New Year and also Merry Christmas, even though it's a little belated for that, too. But All right, I'll take it. I'll take it and I'll say the same to you, Brian. All right, and have a good 2024 and best of luck on your journey that I made. So stay Thank safe. Thank you very much. Rock on. Having us on. Me on. You on. And stay tuned, y'all. <laughs> see ya.